uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce Ross Salahuddinov, who is a UPMC professor of computer science in the Department of Machine Learning at Carnegie Mellon University. He received his PhD in computer science from the University of Toronto after spending two postdoctoral years at MIT, he joined the University of Toronto and later moved to CMU. Ross's primary interests lie in deep learning, machine learning, and large scale optimization. He is an action editor of the Journal of Machine Learning Research. He served as a program co chair for ICML 2019. He served on the senior program committee of several top tier learning conferences, including NeurIPS and ICMO. He is an Alfred P. Sloan Research Fellow, Microsoft Research Faculty Flow, Candidate Research Chair in the Statistical Machine Learning. He is also a recipient of the Early Researcher Award, Google Faculty Award, and NVIDIA's Pioneers of AI Award. And today he is going to be telling us about integrating domain knowledge into deep learning. So, Russ, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for uh, for the invitation. And um, you know, I thought that I would talk today a little bit about you know some of the research that's happening in my lab. And 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 as I go through the talk, if you have any specific questions, feel free to uh, feel free to ask. Me. So, what is it that we want to do? Uh, well. Over the last decade, we've seen, you know, a substantial impact, I would say, from, uh, from uh, uh, deep learning. And, uh, you know, that's an area within machine learning that, you know, essentially uh, works with uh, so-called neural networks. And if you look at the space of, you know, speech recognition, computer vision, um, uh, in the space of recommender systems, uh, such as, for example, you know, many of you are probably using Netflix is using some of these approaches. Language understanding is something that we're going to talk in, in this talk today as well. There's also spaces like drug discovery and medical image analysis. And uh, one question is that, what is it that we want to do? Well, we want to build AI. Um, we want to be able to develop algorithms, algorithms that can see and recognize objects around us. We want to develop algorithms that can understand human speech so you can talk to uh, your agents. Uh, you want to be able to develop algorithms that can reason and understand natural language you know, you know uh, algorithms that navigate autonomously, that can explore a plan and in general display human-like intelligence. It's a sort of uh, a high level goal. Now, when we think about um, what are some of the challenges or where, you know, uh, the community is, is moving, well, there's a lot of works happening in our community, but I would say there's sort of, you know, uh, a few key challenges. So there's a lot of work happening in the space of natural language understanding and reasoning. And I'm gonna you know, show you some examples of what that means. Um, there is also some work happening in the space of what's called embodied AI, uh, which covers the space of reinforcement learning, deep reinforcement learning and control, actually building robots. You can think of it as robots that can move around, that can understand and, uh, and I'll show you some examples of that. The other important area of research is how do we incorporate some domain knowledge into our algorithms, some prime knowledge into our algorithms, right? A lot of work that's been done in our community is more what we call black box, where you build a complex model, input goes in, output goes out, and that's, you, you, you know, you're training this model. But how do we incorporate some structure or some prior, some domain knowledge into these systems is, is, is a very important area of research. And also, um, there is a lot of work happening in the space of uh, multimodal learning. How do you combine different sources of data, like images, video, sound? Um, how do you um, build systems that can uh, learn from semi-supervised data? What that means is that you, know, you might have a lot of images unlabeled, uh, but maybe a few labeled images. And how do you learn from that? And also in the space of what's called self-supervised learning. This is where you're trying to design algorithms that can you know, learn on their own. They can identify tasks, solve those tasks, and, and, and so forth. So today, we're going to focus primarily on the first three uh, topics. And I'm, uh, I'll, I'll give you an examples of, of, of uh, some of that. So 
let's look at uh, the first topic. Uh, let's look at the space of how do we uh, um, look at the natural language understanding and reasoning and how do we can we incorporate domain knowledge. Uh, and a lot of these slides were also kind of uh, prepared by my student, by the former student, Boan uh, Dingra, who's gonna be joining Duke, uh, I guess, this coming year. Okay, so when we think about um, supervised learning or you know, deep learning in general, we typically think about inputs. These go through neural network and then we produce outputs, right? And there is a way of training these systems. So for example, we can think of, you know, I show you an image and I have to predict, is that a cat or not? Or neural machine translation is another big area of, of research where, you know, I give you an input like I don't speak French and I wanna be able to translate it into French, right? But let's say I give you an example of um, a question, which coronaviruses are known to infect people? Uh, right, and there's uh, multiple answers. The question is, how do you build a system like this? Well, to answer this question, um, you need some prior knowledge, um, right? Now, you, when you're training these systems, maybe that knowledge can be embedded into the weights of the network, of the neural network, or maybe they can be kind of like explicitly learned. But the idea here is that we have a lot of text, maybe we have some structured knowledge, like, like knowledge bases, for example, so how do we take that information and incorporate into, the, uh, into our models is, is a very active area of research. And so some of the key challenges is that the data can be heterogeneous, right? It can come in the form of structures, like sometimes ontologies, sometimes people call it a structured data because they've kind of create, were created by humans. Uh, sometimes data comes in the form of free text like, you know, you open Wikipedia article or news article, and that's the text data that you have. And this is sometimes called unstructured data and, and, and so forth. Uh, we also wanna be able to do some form of basic reasoning. And what that means is that how do we aggregate information across multiple sources of data? You know, um, you know, maybe we can look at the text and that can tell us something about where in the knowledge base we should be looking for a specific um, um, concept to be able to answer, let's say, these questions. And also we wanna be able to do it under what's called weak supervision. And what that means is that, you know, when you're training these models, typically you would have a training data set and the training data set would contain examples like this, which coronaviruses are known to infect people. And it would contain answers, you know, like COVID-19, for example, right? Or SARS. Um, but it's very difficult to obtain fine grain labeling. It's very difficult to go and say, well, in this Wikipedia article, to answer this question, you should look at this sentence. And in this anthology, on this knowledge base, you should look over here to be able to answer that, that, that question, right? So that information is hidden from you, uh, right? And so that's, that's something that we call learning with weak supervision that you know, we don't necessarily have all the labeling information to be able to uh, uh, build the systems. Um, so, so we're gonna focus on one specific topic uh, called uh, open domain question answering, just as an example, right? And this is a very, kind of like common topic that people are studying, uh, including, you know, major IT companies. You know, if, you, if you're using Siri or Google or Cortana or Alexa, they're all sort of relying on, 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 on these uh, technologies. So how do we answer those questions, right? Well, one way of doing this and what's commonly done uh, in today's practice, in particular in the industry, is that I can look at Wikipedia articles, for example, and I can extract extract certain important concepts. I can go and I say, well, you know, diabetes, that's an important concept or disease, that's an important concept. And then perhaps I can go and manually or through some heuristics construct, uh, extract uh, relations. So you can think of them as facts about entities. So I can say, well, diabetes is an instance of a disease, uh, right? And now what's happening in today's practice pretty much is that we're constructing these large scale knowledge bases. Typically those are most commonly constructed by humans, just manually going and constructing them. So for example, you know, companies like Google have these massive knowledge bases. Um, and so if you ask a question, then if you can figure out where in the knowledge base you should be looking, uh, and you can, you know, figure out what, what relations you should be looking at, then, you know, you'll be able to get the answer, uh, right? Now, when we think about, you know, using these systems, um, typically just using knowledge base on their own, on its own is not enough. So for example, imagine I give you the question, 
I can do some form of what's called entity linking in text retrieval. So for example, I can, I can go through 50 million passages and maybe 50 million different entities. And I can extract perhaps 50 passages, think of it like 50 Wikipedia articles and 500 entities. And then what I can do is I can use machine learning algorithms like uh, graph neural networks uh, as an example to go through that stage and produce the answer. Uh, right, so one key concept that we've been looking at uh, over the last few years is to how do we combine these two sources of data? We have structured data, think of it as our prior or our domain knowledge constructed by humans, but we also have unstructured data, Wikipedia articles, and how do we fuse the information together from two of these sources, right? And again, this is kind of the idea here is that what you can do is if you have certain concepts that are coming from the knowledge graph, and you have certain representations coming from, let's say, text data, unstructured text data, then the information can flow both ways, right? We can use knowledge graph to augment our representation that we learn using deep learning approaches of, uh, you know, understanding sentences. And the other way around, we can extract the representation from the sentences, and that can influence uh, the representation uh, that we are getting uh, in our knowledge graphs. So for example, if I ask you the question, who voices the dog in a family guy, right? Then you might kind of find a path uh, where you say, well, family guy, uh, this is a sentence that relates family guy to Brian. And then through the knowledge base, you can say, well, Brian is a dog and then voiced by you know, um, um, a particular actor, um, right? So the, the sort of the high level picture I want you to see is that this is the fusion of what we have in the knowledge base with the unstructured data, right? So let's see how we do it. Well, typically when we have a question, what we're gonna do is we're gonna get the representation of the question. Typically, we're gonna be using some form of recurrent neural network. Uh, more recently, you know, there are extensions of um, these networks, something that's called transformer architectures. Um, but essentially what they do is uh, they extract representations that are coming from uh, the sentences. We're also gonna be extracting representations that are coming from entities in the knowledge graph, as well as the sentences, let's say sentences in our Wikipedia articles. Think of these sentences being on the order of like 500 that we're retrieving. And then the idea here is that we're gonna be using graph neural network to fuse information, to propagate information between the entities in our knowledge base and the sentence level representations. And once we get the representations here, then we're gonna be looking at the dot product, essentially looking at the cosine similarity between the question and what we get out of our graph neural network. Uh, and then kind of looking at that, we'll be able to produce, you know, figure out what the answer is. Now, uh, let me uh, show you a little bit uh, in more detail what, uh, how we can pose this question. So we have a graph um, and we have vertices and edges in the graph, and we have a natural language question, right, which contains a sequence of words. We want to be able to learn a function f, and that's going to be our, uh, you know, typically a graph neural network function, such that for every vertex in our node, this function will spit out zero, one, and we want it to produce one, if and only if that particular question, um, uh, the v is, you know, the node in the graph is the answer for that particular question, right? So we have multiple nodes in the graph. We're gonna be learning this function f such that if it's one, if it answers the question and it's zero, if it doesn't answer the question, um, right? And uh, the way that we're also gonna model it is we're gonna say, well, the probability of producing the correct answer is gonna be given by the softmax representation. So here HQ is the question representation that we get from a recurrent neural network. In our case, we were using LSTM type of networks, a special type of recurrent neural network. In HV is the representation that we're getting from a graph convolutional neural network, okay? And the graph convolutional neural network, again, it combines both textual data and the data that's coming from the knowledge graph. Now, graph convolutional, you've probably heard about, you know, convolutional neural networks. Some of you might've heard about, you know, feed forward neural networks or convolutional neural networks. And there's a class of models called graph convolutional networks, so graph neural networks. And the idea behind these models is actually very, very simple. The idea is that if you have a graph structure, then you can say, well, the representation of this red node here is gonna be given by 
I take the weighted average of all the notes, um, you know, weighted by, um, uh, by, you know, by specific, I guess here we have a specific parameter alpha, but that's not very important. So you take the representations of these notes um, and then you, mul you, you, you multiply them by a specific parameter W, right? And then you take the representation of your own note at time T minus one, and you pass it through nonlinear function F. Um, so this looks a lot like recurrent neural networks, uh, but the point here is that the structure of the uh, of, of this kind of recurrent network is given by the graph that's that's given to you, uh, right? So some of you who kind of like work on information theory, or maybe you've looked at uh, you know looked at you know models like belief propagation, it's essentially nonlinear extension of you know nonlinear extension of belief propagation algorithms, um, and so. Uh, these models are now becoming more and more popular, particularly when you're working with graph type of uh, um, uh, uh, structures. And this nonlinearity here is we're typically using sigmoid or 10H nonlinearities to kind of, you know, squish the information. And then this representation is being passed to the, 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 uh, the neighboring node. Uh, the other thing that we can do is we can use uh, uh, these graph neural networks with relations. So for example, you know, we may have multiple relations in our knowledge base, like for example, we say diabetes is an instance of a disease, instance now represents relation. You know, or Barack Obama was born in Hawaii, Barack Obama is the entity, was born with the relation. So it's a, it's a different type of relation. And so you can have these parameters parameterized by R. So each relation can have its own parameter. So when you're asking the question, depending what relations you've extracted, you're gonna be using those parameters uh, to propagate information in, in the graph. And so now the information can get propagated between unstructured text and structured text, right? So for example, if we're trying to learn the representation of a sentence that's commonly done in you know, a lot of deep learning uh, 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 models, we can actually take the representations that we're getting from the knowledge graph and augment them uh, together, right? So now we have a much better representation that's coming from, from the sentences. And the other way around, we can actually get, if we're trying to look at the representation of the knowledge graph, this is what the graph neural network would do, we can actually take the representation of the sentence and you know, uh, uh, augment it you know, as an additional term to get the better representation of the node in our knowledge graph. So what this does, this one, this basically kind of you know, augments information that's, that we have in our knowledge graph, or it augments information from the knowledge graph into the representation learning of sentences, let's say. And typically we have these examples where um, you know, if you're only using text data, this is what typical deep learning models would do, you will achieve some accuracy on these data sets. Uh, if you're only using, uh, sorry, if you're only using knowledge base, you can obviously see uh, KB completeness basically means if, you know, 50% of the knowledge base is gone. So if we erase 50% of the knowledge base, how well would you do, um, right? And so here you basically, what you're seeing is that uh, by combining both sources of data, you can actually significantly increase the accuracy, performance accuracy. So here, the, the accuracy is measured in terms of uh, hits at one, which basically means that did you answer the question correctly or not? Um, and uh, you know, the other thing to note here is that our knowledge bases sometimes can be incomplete, right? So whenever you say, you know, as an example, COVID nineteen didn't exist, you know, up until December of two years ago, I guess now. Um, so this concept just didn't exist. And then as it you know, shows up, uh, you need to augment your knowledge base, uh, right? And so that's a difficult task uh, to do it. So humans have to manually go do it. But if you're augmenting it with you know, news articles or Wikipedia articles, um, then you can start answering questions much quicker right? because the information is complementary. Now, one uh, other thing that I wanted to uh, talk about uh, is the following question, which is uh, something that's called multi-hop questions, um, which a lot of existing systems basically have hard time dealing with. So let me show you an example. Uh, let's say I ask you the following question. Where is the company which manufactured Vogelboss headquartered? And Vogelboss is a type of specific type of a drug, right? So now how do you answer the question like this? Well, to answer the question like this, you have to kind of decompose it into two questions. You might, you kind of like have to say, well, which company manufactures a specific drug? Once I know which company manufactures it, then I can figure out where it's headquartered. 
right? And so, you know, for example, if you kind of unroll it and you ask what the first question, which company manufactures this drug, then through Wikipedia and through some of these uh, approaches, you can actually figure out that, you know, Voglibos is a product of Takeda Pharmaceutical Company, right? And then the next question, you can say, well, what Takeda Pharmaceutical Company is, is located in, in Osaka. So the answer should be Osaka, right? So you can say, okay, that's fine. The issue is the internals of these states are unknown, right? If I ask you this question, I'm not gonna tell you, well, first answer this question and then answer this question. And so typically what happens with a lot of technologies today, you know, again, I, I make an example of Siri or Google or Alexa. If you ask those types of questions, most of the time, a lot of existing systems would just not be able to answer those questions, all right? Uh, because the internals are unknown. So how do we, you know, how do we uh, get the representation here? What can we do here? Um, right, and then there's a lot of uh, prior work that's essentially trying to design heuristics, uh, you know, to figure out what the answers should be and how you compose the questions into two questions, for example. But the question is, can we do it in an end-to-end -end fashion? Meaning that can we design a system that we can train in an end-to-end -end way? Can we make it efficient? Um, so that we can answer questions quickly. And can we also build some form of compositionality? So, you know, we can answer two cop questions, we can answer three cop questions and so forth, right? Uh, now, these kinds of questions are not very common, uh, I guess, in general, for, for kind of like general type of questions, but they become very, very common for, you know, when you're dealing with technical documents. So when you're dealing with legal documents or, we deal, or when you're dealing with specific financial documents, these questions become more and more prominent. Uh, these types of questions. So let me first uh, show you the system that we've built. So, um, so let's say I ask you the question, which company founded by Steve Jobs was based, in, was based in Redwood City? Okay, and just to show you, this system is running on a single machine using a single GPU. Uh, so what, what's happening here, you're analyzing 5 million Wikipedia article, articles, and you're basically getting re results in a fraction of a second. So to us, this was, you know, in, in the computer science land, if this was work done jointly with Google, we really care about speed as well. I mean, we care about accuracy, but we also really care about the speed. Um, and so for example, here, the system basically retrieves this paragraph that says, Jobs was the chairman and CEO of Apple, uh, Pixar, uh, and majority stakeholder in Pixar and, and so forth, and a founder and chairman and CEO of Next. And then finds the second paragraph that says Next, you know, is an American computer soft software company and Steve Jobs was based in Redwood City. So the answer would be next, right? So here what the system does is it retrieves the top candidates and the highlighted in yellow is what the system believes is an important information. So it highlights important sentences and then it aggregates both of that information to produce the answer. Um, right, and it also these are also kind of important facts that it's that, that it's retrieving. So how do we do that? Um, so one of the ideas here is what we call uh, differentiable reasoning. Here is to use what's called follow relational following. So the idea is that given a set of entities, think of them as a set of words, like in this case uh, uh, Voglibos, for example, we're going to follow relation R to arrive to a new set of entities Y. So the idea here is the following. If X is the Vogler boss, then R1, the first relation is the manufacturer. So if we can somehow figure out like, you know, X pass it through relation R, then we're gonna get, we're gonna arrive to a set of entities. So hopefully we're gonna arrive to, you know, Takeda Pharmaceutical Company uh, as an example. And then we're gonna follow relation two. We're gonna ask what's the headquarter location, <clears throat> right? And we wanna be able to build these systems in a differentiable way that basically means there's an objective function that we can take gradients off. And if there's an objection function, we can take gradients, then we can you know, update the model parameters. So how do we do that? So the idea is the following. Um, uh, we have text corpus. So think of text corpus as you know, millions and millions of sentences. We call them mentions, but think of them as sentences. And we have you know, millions of entities you know, just words like Family Guy, Brian, Barack Obama, you know, University of Colorado, 
you know, so these are all become entities. So we were working with, uh, I think the number of entities we were working with is about 500 million. And the number of mentions, what we call mentions or sentences is also on the order of 500 million. Um, right, so think of that just extracting all sentences from Wikipedia articles. So take the entire Wikipedia set, all the sentences, that basically becomes uh, what we call mentions, right? So now let's say I give you family guy as an as a entity and I give you a relation. I wanna find the dog in the show, right? So what am, what am I gonna do? Well, the first thing I need to do is I need to expand X, the co-occurring mention. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say, well, X occurs in 10,000 sentences. I'm gonna take all of those 10,000 sentences. Right, because family guy occurs in this sentence, it occurs in this sentence, it occurs in this sentence. Right, so that's more of a retrieval aspect. The second thing, what we're gonna do, and this is where machine learning comes in, is we're gonna filter those mentions based on relation, right? So this sentence doesn't really talk about dog in the show. This sentence doesn't talk about dog in the show. This sentence talks about the dog in the show. So we're gonna let this uh, 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 kind of, you know, information passed through and these ones are going to be filtered out. And again, this is where learning happens because we need to kind of build the system such that it understands how X dot follow this particular relation gets filtered. And once we do that, we're going to be combining the scores of the same entity. So it's more like, uh, you know, projecting all the information that we have back to our entities and, uh, and we're gonna get the score. And so one of the key ideas here is that we can do a lot of that, a lot of these operations by just using inner products. So these are the products between entities uh, or the products between the representations that we're learning. So at the end of the day, basically after we uh, do this filtering, it just becomes K nearest neighbor search, um, right? And we can do it very efficiently, you know, with millions of, uh, you know, in, in very, in, you know, in, in high dimensional spaces, but we can also do it very efficiently. So let's look at the, how do we expand X to co-occurring mentions very quickly. Let's say we have a family guy, and then we're gonna construct a matrix. And this matrix is gonna be pre-computed. It's gonna take value one if entity J co-occurs with mention R, with mention I. So if particular entity actually occurs in a particular sentence. So it's number of sentences, 500 million by number of entities, 500 million. So it's a very large sparse matrix. It's just maps which words occur in which sentences, right, essentially. Okay, that gets pre-computed. And so when we say we're gonna look for family guy, we're gonna retrieve all the sentences that talk about, you know, uh, uh, family guy. And so now how do we filter the mentions? Well, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take our query, our sentence, and we're gonna embed it into some latent space. And this embedding is done through something that's called transformer architecture. I don't have time to go into details what that architecture is, but think of it as more of an extension of, uh, you know, a fancier way of, of, of extending recurrent neural networks. So it's a way of taking sequential data and converting it into high dimensional vector. So now we're operating in a, you know, we, 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 we're now operating, instead of looking at the words, we're operating, everything uh, is done in the vector spaces now, right? And so we look at the inner products and this inner product will define the higher the inner product, the higher the score, the higher, you know, this particular sentence uh, relates to this particular relation, right? And this is done through pre-trained large scale language models. So now what is it that we do? Well, we get the relation, we embed all of these sentences using these transformer architectures into you know, um, what we call an offline index. So what we effectively end, end up happening is we take every sentence in a Wikipedia article and we represent it in our case, uh, I think it was 100 dimensional vector. So all sentences are now 100 dimensional vectors. So we have 500 million by a uh, hundred uh, dimension matrix. And so we essentially we've compressed the entire Wikipedia into that space, right? And so now we're essentially looking at the nearest neighbor search, which is, uh, you know, can be done fairly efficiently by looking at the scoring between, you know, the relation that we have and the representations that we're getting from our transformer architectures, right? 
And once we kind of like look at the dot product, we take the top K and that's what we get out of, um, out of follow relations, right? That gives us the sentences that specifically satisfy that particular relation. Now I'm missing, I'm, I'm missing you know, quite a few details because we actually learning what these representations are. So at the training time, what happens is that, and we're learning what these representations are. So at the training time, we have some examples of correctly answering the questions. And through this procedure, we retrieve the top K and we're hoping that the correct answer is in the top K. And if it's in the top K, we are updating the model parameters so that you know, the correct answer hits the top K. <clears throat> So there are a few details of how you know, we actually do backpropagation in these models and how do we update the parameters of this model, but that's the basic idea. <clears throat> so now what we do is we basically take our representations, we do element-wise dot product by um, multiplying which mention survive. And then finally, we basically take these representations and we transform them back to the entities. So this matrix B is like a transpose of matrix A. And this basically allows us to um, um, you know, get entities back and we look at the best scores and that would give us the answer. Right? So at the end of the day, you can think of the entire system as just you know, finding uh, all the sentences that contain information you're looking for and where the learning happens is trying to figure out how do we filter out that information so that we only left with the most important uh, uh, sentences and those then, 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 then go into uh, basically giving us the answer. And so this entire operation, we're expanding, we're filtering, this is where learning happens and we're combining the scores. Um, it's efficient because we can do it in the polylog time. M is the vocabulary size. So uh, number of mentions. So essentially, you know, we can do it a fairly efficient even when we're dealing with 500 million uh, mentions. It's closed on the composition so we can handle multi-hop questions because you know, whatever, got, whatever we get out of here is, uh, is an entity and we can follow relation multiple times and it's differentiable. So we can take the gradients and back propagate the gradients through these operations. And that's exactly what we do when we learn the parameters of this, um, um, of, 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 uh, of this matrix. Um, one thing that I also wanted to uh, point out is that when we talk about domain knowledge or the structure, what we're essentially doing is, you know, we, we use some form of entity link and think of it as identifying important uh, words in the question. And then we're using transform architecture. Again, it's just think of it as like a recurrent neural network, a form of recurrent neural network. And we use the second transformer architecture to do the second follow relation. Uh, but what's important here I want to emphasize is that instead of pushing this question through black box neural network or through black box transformer to give us the answer, we're actually decomposing our model into these local pieces. And this is where domain knowledge comes in because we know something about uh, how questions are formed. And that precisely allows us to you know, build a system that can answer these multiple questions, multiple hot questions. So the system here becomes a little bit more modular, um, right? And you can examine, the system will actually extract the first relation, provides the answer and go through the second relation. So we can actually see what kind of answers the model is giving you, you know, at the first sta stage. And by analyzing, you, you can get a little bit of, you know, some form of, um, uh, understanding if the model is making a mistake, why is it making mistakes? Okay. And it's an end-to-end -end model, so we can actually backpropagate gradients through the entire system. And if we, you know, if we look at kind of results, uh, we can kind of like see that if you're using graph neural networks, which is kind of one of the baselines, these models are not very kind of, you know, good at handling multi-hop questions. But if we look at, you know, these more structured approaches, we can actually ask, answer questions you know, quite reliably. For the one hop question, genetic questions, like what's the weather like today? You know, it doesn't matter, right? But for more complex questions where you have to use um, you know, these, these, uh, these uh, compositionality in terms of constructing the questions, then it makes quite a big difference. And in terms of speed, uh, also these models are quite fast because we're building these offline indices. Uh, we're basically compressing the entire Wikipedia article into the vector-based representation. So we never need to go and look back in text 
uh, deal with text again. Everything is now represented in a vector based space. Um, here's another example. Just wanted to show you uh, another example where if I ask you what's the shape of the family of viruses containing coronavirus, the system essentially retrieves that, you know, coronaviruses are, I think they belong to the family of coronaviridae. And this coronaviridae, you know, uh, are known to be spherical, right? So the answer would be spherical. So, you know, uh, of course, the system sometimes fails, uh, but in many cases, it actually does provide reasonable answers by doing this form of decomposition. And in general, one of the big questions that we are facing today is this idea of how do we represent common sense knowledge? You know, Multi-hop reasoning, I think as humans, you know, if I ask you a complex question, you can reason about that question. You can decompose into multiple questions and say, well, if I find the answer to the first one, I can answer the second one. Machines are not very good at doing that right now. Uh, human knowledge is also abstract. It's built on high level concepts. Like for example, we know dogs have four legs. So if we look at the computer vision systems today, you know, basic, you know, convolutional neural networks, you know, if you give an image like this, the model will say it's a dog. But if I take this dog and I put two extra heads on this dog, so it's gonna be dog with three heads, the model will just likely with the same confidence would say it's a dog. And the reason why it would do that is because it's doing pattern recognition. And it, as long as it finds a few patterns that are reflective of the dog, it will say it's a dog. Or if I take this dog and I add, you know, four more legs, so it's going to be dog with eight legs, the model will still say it's a dog, uh, right? So there's no notion of this uh, common sense or, or human or kind of like abstract reasoning, uh, right? And so how do we encode this knowledge and how do we do it efficiently into these complex large scale models is still a very, very much open, uh, open question and open, open area of research. Now, in the next kind of like 10 minutes, I also wanted to spend a little bit of time showing you um, another approach, which works on the context of reinforcement learning, but also looks at this idea of building something modular or constructing, you know, um, um, and it also kind of, you know, we'll see some integration of, of language and reinforcement learning as well. So let me switch gears just a little bit uh, on, on embodied AI uh, kind of uh, systems. So, when we think about reinforcement learning, we really think about kind of learning behaviors. We think about learning to map a sequence of observations to actions. And we wanna achieve a particular goal, right? So for example, if we think about physical intelligence, you have an agent, the agent observes the environment, takes an action, and an action acts upon the environment. And you know, if we think about actually building physical robots, uh, they need to move around the world physically, obviously. Um, the action that you're taking right now will in fact impact future observations. So for example, if I'm seeing this couch here, if I turn left, I'm gonna see something different than you know, compared to what if, if I turn right, right? So depending what action I take, I'm gonna see different things. Um, and you know, it also requires some notion of special and semantic understanding of the world, uh, right? So one kind of like thing that we're gonna to focus today is, is on the goal, specific goal of navigation. Um, so for example, if I tell my agent, go to a particular location, if it gets there, you get the reward, a positive reward. If it doesn't get negative rewards, typically that's how reinforcement learning uh, algorithms are set up. So for example, given observation, you pass it, you would typically pass it through some form of neural network. The neural network give you the action, which action you want to take. And sometimes you get rewards, uh, positive rewards or negative rewards. If this was a good action, you get positive reward. It was a bad action, you get a negative reward. These rewards are typically sparse. Um, and you can train the system, right? Like if it's a positive reward, you, you adjust the parameters of the model to say that was a good action, do more of it. If it was a negative reward, you say, well, it was a bad action, don't do it again, essentially. Um, and so we can train these systems, uh, right? Now we can also think about goal conditioned navigation. So for example, I can tell you go to this specific location or there's a lot of work happening on the image goal navigation. I show you an image of a TV and I tell you, you know, go find me my TV, um, right? So the agent has to understand and do some form of image recognition. There's also a notion of object goal. I tell you in a word, go find me a chair, a TV. And, you know, there is also more complex systems where I give you actually uh, the goal in terms of, you know, language uh, or an instruction what to do. Um, and this is probably convenient for humans because it has the notion of compositionality and, and so forth. 
So, you know, think of it as, you know, I specify, I give you instruction in natural language and you want your agent to go and execute that. So ideally in the futuristic world, we're gonna tell our agent, go make me coffee, uh, you know, get me a latte and the robot would know how to, what that means, right? Um, here's one system that we've built uh, just to show you. Uh, so here's a little robot that moves around. And as it moves around, it's building what we call semantic map of the world. So these uh, uh, images here basically represent free spaces. Uh, these kind of colored images represent, so it identifies there's a couch here, there's a sofa here, uh, there's a TV here, these are walls. And what it's doing is it's looking for potted plant. Right? So it understands the notion of the potted plant, what that means. And now in this environment, you know, it's a new environment, you're kind of learning, moving around the environment and you, you're trying to figure out how to get to the potted plant, uh, right? So how do we build these systems? One of the biggest problems in the context of uh, reinforcement learning is uh, the notion of exploration, right? You want kind of, uh, you know, it's almost like when, you know, when kids grow up, they're very curious, right? The way we learn as humans, we, we want to do many, many different things. And that's the notion of, uh, of exploration. We don't want our robots to kind of like take two steps forwards and then two steps backwards and then two steps forwards and then two steps backwards because you're essentially not exploring the environment. Um, so exploration is one of, you know, one of the key kind of um, concepts in reinforcement learning. So for example, in this case, you want your agents to move around and really explore the environment as efficiently as it can, uh, right? And so how do we do that? Well, how do we explore the environment? Well, typically if you think about end-to-end -end reinforcement learning algorithms, it's very hard for them to learn about the mapping of the world and kind of like do planning and so forth. And they typically don't generalize uh, uh, well, well enough. And one of the things that we're doing is something similar to what we're doing in the context of language understanding. We're gonna be incorporating the strength of learning. So we're gonna be using learning to figure out what that environment is, to learn more about the environment. But we're also gonna be looking at the hierarchical system or modular systems. So we can map different pieces of the, of the architecture so that we can learn it more efficiently, okay? So here we've been building something what we call the neural SLAM, uh, which, which stands for simultaneous localization and mapping. It's a core concept in robotics communities and robotics people have been doing it for a very long time. I think that you know, if any of you ever worked on self-driving cars or you know, drones, this concept of SLAM is, becomes very, very important. Um, and so the idea here is that given an input like this image, for example, we're gonna try to learn the map, a local map. So for example, here we're basically saying, oh, there is a, uh, there is a, a wall here, so we can't bump into the wall, but there is a free space here, right? That's kind of like represented here. So the neural slam uses computer vision algorithms and uh, you know, deep learning approaches to actually try to figure out where the walls are where the obstacles are, where the free space is, uh, right? And it also estimates the pose. So think of it as X, Y coordinates of your agent. Now, based on that, there is a reinforcement learning policy that you know, predicts what the long-term goal should be. So for example, here, the global policy would say, you know, go explore this part of the space because I don't know much about this space. Um, I haven't seen it, so that's a good space for me to explore. Once you get that, there is something that's called the planner what the planet does is it tries to look at the partially observed map and figure out what's the best path to get to the goal. So this is where you're constructing the path on the partially observed you know, map of the environment that you've built so far. And then based on that, you create something that we call a short-term goal. So typically for us, when we're building these systems, it's about you know, a meter. So we're trying to, to basically say, how do we move the agent such that within one meter, we actually follow our path? Uh, so there is a short-term goal and then there's a local policy and the local policy actually produces the action. And the action is move 25 centimeters or turn 20 degrees to the right and so forth. So these are low level actions that the robot actually executes, uh, right? So there are kind of like multiple pieces here. What's important in this framework is that just like we've seen in the language domain, everything is decomposed into local pieces. Um, the, the gradients can flow through these, uh, through these pieces. So what that means is we can train the system in an end-to-end -end way. 
Um, and when we make mistakes, we can train this system, uh, system but uh, it, it's important to note that we can train all of these blocks uh, simultaneously. So it's not like we go train this block and then this block separately and this block separately. Uh, so that's important because you know mistakes that you're making here will get propagated. And so if certain mistakes get here, they get propagated. Uh, right, and this is kind of the system that, again, this is another environment, this is virtual environment, uh, where you have these houses, and you have agent moving around in these houses, and it's basically uh, figuring out um, uh, where the free space is, where the obstacles are, and it's trying to move around this environment as much as it can to learn about the environment, uh, right? Uh, and it's actually very interesting how this data set was constructed. This data set was constructed by uh, students at Berkeley, who went into 500 Airbnb apartments and much like with Google Street, you just took photographs and stitched it together using computer vision techniques and just created this virtual, um, virtual environment, which is kind of very cool for building these algorithms. And by building our algorithms in this virtual environment, we're able to successfully transfer learned representations onto the real robot. So the robot that I've shown you before is actually relying on information and in all the structure that it's learning from these environments, which is pretty cool. And now if you kind of like look at the exploration results, you know, you can kind of see that, um, you know, we're exploring quite well in terms of the coverage. This is one environment that's called Gibson. There's another environment which is much harder environment. Uh, but what I do want to show you is that in the examples, um, where we say uh, these are what we call hard examples. Hard examples correspond to this, correspond to the settings where we need to go very far away to achieve the goal. So for example, you know, in a very big house, I tell you go from one point to the other point. And if this other point is very far away from where you are, then traditional reinforcement learning algorithms, these black box reinforcement algorithms, reinforcement learning algorithms just basically fail miserably, right? Uh, and so you need a lot, a lot of data uh, to kind of like get them working. So, you know, uh, as an example, you know, you've probably heard some success stories that are coming out from companies like OpenAI, where they've trained these deep reinforcement learning agents to play games, so to, you know, navigate in these complex environments. And what happens there is that, you know, you need to train your model for about, you know, a hundred years of, you know, human type of uh, 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 years of training, right? And in the real robotics, you basically might have like a few hours to adapt your system to a specific environment, right? Uh, so these models fail and because they don't have this specific structure, they don't have this notion of mapping, planning, and, and, and so forth. So they basically fail quite, uh, uh, quite badly. Right. Now, one final thing, and, and I'm gonna be done, is this notion of image goal, uh, which is also very interesting where, you know, how do we incorporate semantic prize and common sense? So for example, let's say I tell you, go to this target image. You know, find this, this target image in this environment. It's an image of a stove, right? And the question is, which path would you take? Would you take path number one, path number two, or path number three as you're exploring the environment? Well, obviously most of us would probably choose path number two, maybe path number one, right? How many of you would go up, up the stairs to look for the stove? Um, probably not many, many of us, right? Because we typically know that kitchens are located on the first floor and stoves are located in kitchens. So, you know, there is no need for us to explore upstairs. Um, right. And we typically use it in the everyday kind of uh, as our priors. And most of these, you know, reinforcement learning or, or, you know, deep learning algorithms basically don't struggle to do so because to the algorithm, all three paths are equally probable. You've unexplored them. Right. Um, and so, you know, one of the things that we've been also trying to do is we've been trying to build these topological maps where we're basically trying to build a map of the environment based on the topology of the space, right? So just office and kitchens and so forth. And we're using these graph-based representation, much like what we've been doing with the graph neural networks in the language space, where nodes here represent areas and regular nodes would represent areas that we've explored and ghost nodes here would represent unexplored areas. And so what the learning does through the process of learning at the, on, at the training time, it actually learns that these hallways, or whenever you have doors, are very good representations of unexplored areas. So if you look around and you see a hallway or you see a door, you basically say that's a very good unexplored area, uh, right? Because based on the training, 
these areas typically lead to new rooms or they lead to new kind of you know open areas to explore right now let's say here is the goal image that, that you're trying to uh, to to uh, navigate to it's kind of hard, a little bit hard to see what they are but but again these gold notes really represent kind of you know uh, unexplored area. and this is where the priors are coming in uh, uh, where you can you know incorporate some of these visual priors um, right and so this is what the representation looks like. You're trying to get to this goal, which is a 360 degree view. And this is what the agent does. It kind of like figures out the next node to go to, gets to that node, figures out what the next node is, you know, and goes to that node, right? So you see it expands and navigates and expands and navigates. And through the vision prior, it's actually learning to move into these large spaces. Um, and so in terms of, you know, these slam type of algorithms, we are updating the graphs. Um, and then the rest remains the same. And if you kind of compare it to the neural slam type of models, you know, there's a topological representation and then there's like a metric based representation, right? So in both cases, you know, both have advantages and disadvantages. And, and finally, to, to kind of just to show you that um, this is one of the standard slides that show that we do better than other methods. Um, and, and in fact, we do in terms of you know, success metric of achieving the goal and how fast we're achieving the goal and so forth. Um, and now we've been actually trying to build systems that can go from, uh, um, you know, can go from images into this 3D representation of the world. I think that's probably gonna be the next frontier of kind of you know, you know, building reinforcement learning algorithms and, and trying to understand semantically what the world is like, uh, right? This is just one example as I've shown you before this is where, you know, as the agent moves around, it basically builds the semantic map of the environment. It knows where the couch is, where the tables are, you know, where the staircase and so forth, right? And again, this is an example of the agent moving around. This was learned in a simulation, but transferred into the real robot and it's finding this spotted plant, right? So you kind of like see from the first perception from the camera view of, of the robot that it moves around and you see it understands there is a couch, there are walls and so forth. and uh, builds this kind of like semantic map of the world. So finally, one of, you know, one of the other big areas of research is to kind of go from simulation to real, uh, right? There's some things called physical domain gap because what we see in the simulation and, you know, uh, um, the noise that we see in our actuation noise, the way that the robot moves is not the same as what happens in the real world. So how do we bridge that gap? There's also visual gap, like how to go from visual representation to the real world uh, uh, representation, right? And so, you know, as I mentioned, there is actuation noise, there's a sensor noise and, and so forth. And this is one of the things that we've been trying to do as well. Um, and now what we're actually doing right now is we're trying to give our agent instructions in natural language. So we're trying to combine language understanding together with, you know, this representation that these robots are learning uh, of, of, of the environment. And so that brings me to the end of the talk. I think that, you know, there is this, inspiration and I think we're going to get there and I think we're going to get there you know hopefully fairly soon where we're going to have agents as, as, as I've shown to you that move around that can understand the world around you and, and at the first stage first stage even understand you know what what is the couch what is the tv what is the sofa what is the free space and that can you know deal with a multimodal input such as if I give you instruction natural language it, the, the agent would understand that that can do some form of reasoning and, and, and so forth. So it's really this concept of building robots that can you know, understand multimodal input, vision, language, speech, uh, that can do some form of reasoning, basic reasoning, and you know, you know, na na navigate autonomously and, uh, and, and you know, localize and plan and so forth. And on that note, I'll stop and I you know, say thanks to all of my students, it's, uh, it's, it's the work of my students that's uh, made it possible. So, um, so a lot of work is, is, you know, credit goes to them. So thank you.